AI just translated the oldest Sumerian tablets, and what it found threatens to rewrite the story of human origins. Forget myths and dusty museum labels, machine learning sifted through thousands of tangled wedge-shaped signs from Eridu and Nippur, reconstructing lost lines scholars have struggled with for decades. Instead of a single divine creation, the AI uncovered evidence of early human prototypes, worker classes that could not reproduce, and cryptic warnings about function-bearing life. If these translations are accurate, everything from our intelligence to our divisions might trace back to a conscious act of design and a cosmic rivalry that shaped the fate of our species. What new dangers could this knowledge unleash? Cuneiform isn't just old, it's a nightmare for translators. Over a thousand unique signs, each with shifting meanings depending on the scribe, the city, or even the year. Some tablets are so worn that half the symbols look like random scratches. Others are split in pieces, scattered across museums in Baghdad, London, or Berlin, their paperwork lost to war or time. Eridu's clay records, some pulled from the mud in the 19th century, others from new digs at Giasu, come with their own trail of catalog numbers, photos, and faded dig notes. Every fragment has to be tracked, logged, and compared against digital scans and museum archives just to confirm what's real. Then came the machines. Researchers started feeding these tangled wedge signs into neural networks, models built on the Transformer blueprint, the same tech behind modern translation apps. The process starts by digitizing every tablet, turning crumbling clay into high-resolution images and Unicode sign strings. Each sign isn't just a picture. It's tokenized, broken into subword chunks, and mapped against thousands of known variants from the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus. The AI learns to spot patterns, fill gaps, and even guess at missing endings, like it's piecing together a jigsaw puzzle with half the box missing. Accuracy is everything. For formal genres, royal decrees, omen lists, the machine scores a BLEU of about 37, which is strong for a language with no living speakers. But poetry and myth, that's where things get dicey. The model sometimes hallucinates, inventing lines that sound right but aren't in any museum record. That's why every translation passes through a human filter. Leader seriologists review the AI's output, flag errors, and tweak ambiguous phrases. The whole pipeline is open source, peer-reviewed, and version logged. Every decision, every fix, every fragment traced back to its source. But not everyone is on board. In Israel and Iraq, heated debates break out over how much to trust the machine. Some coders want to restore every missing line, others say only what's visible should count. Curators in Baghdad call it a gift. Finally, their ancestors' words can speak again. But some religious leaders see danger in letting algorithms rewrite sacred history. One thing's clear, with these tools, nothing stays buried in the clay for long. Inside the translation labs, the optimism starts to crack. It's not just a technical challenge anymore, it's a full-blown academic turf war. On one side, you've got the maximalists, coders and digital linguists who want the AI to fill every gap, restore every lost syllable, even if it means guessing. They argue that with enough data, the machine can spot patterns no human ever could. On the other side, the conservatives. Veteran Assyriologists, cautious to the core, who insist that only what's visible on the clay should count. If a sign is missing, leave it blank. No room for fantasy. The lead Assyriologist, Dr. Tariq Al-Khalidi, walks the line between both camps. He's seen how the model can hallucinate, especially in mythic or poetic texts. Sometimes, the output reads like a fever dream, lines that echo real Sumerian, but twist into phrases that never existed. In one notorious case, the AI stitched together a prayer to Enlil out of three different genres, inventing a ritual that had no precedent in any museum archive. The error logs fill up fast. In the post-editing room, every flagged line gets a second look. Was this phrase ever attested? Does it match anything in the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus? Or is it a digital ghost, 
a product of the model's hunger for completion. The transparency is brutal. Each fix, each debate, is version logged and peer-reviewed on open platforms. Scholars from Baghdad to Tel Aviv to London can watch the arguments play out in real time. Some accuse the machine of colonial overreach, imposing Western logic on ancient voices. Others say it's the only way to rescue these stories before they vanish for good. But no matter the camp, everyone agrees. The AI is only as good as its human editors. Every translation is a negotiation, a tug of war between restoration and restraint, and the stakes are rising. With every new batch of decoded lines, the content gets stranger. Patterns start to form, repeated phrases, odd classifications, hints at something deeper than myth. The machine can spot them, but can it be trusted to tell us what they mean? That's the question that splits the room and it's not going away. The AI starts spitting out lines that no one expects. Over and over, the same strange phrases appear. Function bearing life. Those who do not multiply. Clay of lower glow. These aren't the poetic flourishes of a single scribe. They crop up in tablets from Eridu, Nippur, even in fragments separated by centuries and hundreds of miles. The neural network, trained on tens of thousands of lines, flags them as statistically linked, co-occurring in contexts that talk about creation, labor, and the shaping of mankind. What do these phrases mean? The old translations glossed right over them, calling them metaphors or scribal quirks. But the model keeps finding them in the same lexical neighborhoods, right next to words for work, task, duty. In the Atrahasis tablets, a goddess boasts, I have created man to carry the burden of the gods. In the Sumerian Enki and Ninma myth, new humans are molded from clay, but some are called those who do not multiply. The AI, cross-checking line after line, finds negative markers. Nutuda, Nunamta, phrases for not born, not fated, those who cannot give birth. It gets weirder. Some tablets describe batches, groups of humans, each with a purpose, each tested for their ability to perform a specific role. If one fails, another is made. One fragment lists figures fashioned of clay of lesser glow, a phrase the AI matches with later Akkadian texts describing inferior or temporary servants. These aren't just stories of a single act of creation. They read like lab notes, prototypes, revisions, failures. Each batch is described in terms of function, not family. No mention of parents, no lineage, just the job they were meant to do. So, were the first humans ever meant to last? Or were they disposable tools built for a purpose and then replaced? The tablets don't answer. But the pattern is there, stamped in clay and now echoed by the machine. The question hangs in the air. If humans were designed as tools, who decided when it was time for an upgrade? Meet Adapa. In the AI's reassembled myth cycles, he's not just another clay figure molded for toil. He's the prototype who breaks the rules. The tablets, when stitched together by the model, keep circling back to a single moment. The upgrade. Before Adapa, the texts talk about humans as tools, function bearers, those who do not multiply, batches tested and discarded like broken pottery. But then, a line from Nippur, a phrase from Eridu, the AI flags a sudden switch, a human who can speak, think, even refuse the gods. That's Adapa. The pattern is uncanny. In the old fragments, Adapa is described as wise, able to command the wind, but still denied something fundamental. The AI draws a thread between this and a cluster of phrases about revision and mercy. Enki, the god of water and craft, steps in. He doesn't just patch the design, he gives Adapa intelligence, language, the ability to question. Suddenly, the clay worker isn't just following orders, he's making choices. But there's a catch. When Adapa is summoned before Anu, the high god, he refuses the food of immortality, just as Enki told him. Wisdom, yes. Eternal life, no. The model picks up on the double-edged nature of this upgrade. In one batch of lines, humans are disposable. 
In the next, their agents, capable of reproduction and memory, but forever cut off from the god's own fate. The AI's cross-referencing even finds echoes of this pivot in later myths, the moment when the human project stops being a tool and starts becoming a risk. Adapa's story isn't an accident. The machine's clustering shows it's the hinge. After him, the tablets talk less about failed prototypes and more about consequences, about freedom, control, and what happens when the creation starts asking questions. The upgrade comes with a price, and the tablets don't let you forget it. The tablets don't just tell stories, they record a feud that shaped everything. Enki, the god of water and wisdom, believed in growth. Enlil, the lord of air and order, wanted control. Their rivalry isn't just mythic drama, it's a clash over who gets to hold the keys to knowledge and who gets locked out. Lines from Eridu and Nippur keep surfacing with odd inventories, lists that read like blueprints or forbidden catalogs. Wings, sometimes described as appendages, sometimes as devices. Heat and thunder, phrases that, in the hands of a modern engineer, almost sound like propulsion. And then, the most chilling, fire that erases flesh. Not a campfire, not a torch, but something more final. The logograms are rare, scattered, and fiercely debated. Some call them poetic. Others, including a material scientist brought in by the translation team, aren't so sure. She points out that the same cluster of signs for metal, heat, and flight show up in texts from different centuries, different cities. Coincidence? Maybe. But the clustering is hard to ignore. What's clear is that these lists aren't shared with everyone. Only certain lines of humans, those favored by Enki or trusted by Enlil, get access. The rest are kept in the dark. The tablets describe rituals where knowledge is passed down in secret, sometimes in the shadow of a temple, sometimes just before a storm. The stakes aren't just about who gets to farm or write, it's about who gets to remember and who gets erased. Archaeologists have found burn layers in Nippur and Eridu, sudden destruction that lines up with the mythic flood. The texts call it a reset, a way to wipe out drift from the divine plan. Enki tries to save a remnant, hiding forbidden instructions in clay jars or coded hymns. Enlil wants a clean slate. The technology, if that's what it was, doesn't survive. But the fear of it, the idea that knowledge could be dangerous enough to destroy a world, echoes in every broken line. Star logs from ancient Nippur and Babylon don't just track eclipses or the odd comet, they run for centuries, line after line, tracking the sky with a precision that would impress any modern astronomer. Every planetary crossing, every rare alignment gets a mark. And right in the thick of those records is a word that's fueled endless debate, Nibiru. Some read it as a planet, others as a crossing point, a cosmic ferry. The most detailed omen tablets, like those in the British Museum's MUL.APN series, call Nibiru the place where Jupiter crosses the sky's path, or sometimes Mercury, depending on the season. No rogue planet, no doomsday destroyer. Enter Dr. Lena Weiss, an independent astrophysicist who spent years comparing these clay records to modern astronomical data. Her verdict? The cycles match real planetary movements, Jupiter's 12-year orbit, Mercury's quick loops, but there's zero evidence for a hidden planet or a scheduled apocalypse. The tablets warn of floods, famines, or royal shakeups when Nibiru appears in certain places, but it's all tied to omens, not science fiction. The real story isn't about a planet crashing through the solar system, it's about a society trying to read meaning into the heavens, a cosmic clock ticking out warnings for the chosen few. Sumerian tablets don't just spin tales of gods and creation, they lay out a social blueprint, written in code words that sound more like labels than names. Over and over, the AI flags phrases like clay of strength, blood of brightness, and shadow formed. These aren't poetic flourishes. They show up in ritual hymns, initiation lists, and mythic genealogies, always in the context of who gets to do what, or who's allowed to know. Some lines grant access. Only the blood of brightness may read the star logs or recite the temple prayers. Others are locked out. Clay of strength for labor, shadow formed for menial rites, 
never permitted to touch the sacred tablets or learn the priestly scripts. The numbers don't lie. Out of tens of thousands of translated tablets, ordinary job titles, farmer, scribe, servant, dominate the records. But when these epithets pop up, they cluster in the oldest, most guarded texts. The rules are spelled out. Permissions for writing, ritual, and even language itself are doled out by class, not by merit. The AI's pattern mapping paints a chilling picture. Division by design, knowledge as a gate, and a society where your label decides your fate. The question isn't whether the gods played favorites, it's how deep the blueprint of control really ran, and whether it ever truly disappeared. Pressure is mounting for a full audit of the translation process. Scholars and skeptics alike want more than just headlines. They are demanding raw data, segment-level edit logs, and every checkpoint from the AI's pipeline. It's not enough to trust that the model got it right. They want the receipts, which tablets, which corpora, which lines were stitched together, and exactly where a human stepped in to change a phrase or restore a gap. Some researchers are calling for full release of the model's checkpoints and provenance logs, down to the last training run. If a translation hinges on a fragment with questionable origins, that needs to be flagged. If a phrase only appears after a post-editor's intervention, that edit should be documented and traceable. The challenge is out in the open. Can every controversial line be traced back to a real fragment, or is it a ghost born from the machine's hunger for patterns? Until the entire process is transparent, every data set, every edit, every restoration, nobody can claim the final word. The story isn't just about what the tablets say, it's about whether we're willing to show our work and let the world judge what's real and what's wishful thinking. Over 1,000 distinct cuneiform signs from Eridu and Nippur have challenged translators for generations. Now, AI-assisted analysis has exposed patterns in Sumerian tablets, repeated references to non-reproducing workers, staged creation events, and class labels such as clay of strength and shadow formed. These findings suggest a structured, unequal society engineered from its beginnings. Yet, many questions remain. No primary source confirms the existence of advanced technology or a planet Nibiru. Such ideas are debated among scholars. Key tablets are still fragmented or missing, and much of the corpus has never been fully published or peer-reviewed. What is clear is that these texts reveal early attempts to control knowledge, assign roles, and shape collective memory. As more archives are digitized and scrutinized, the story of human origins remains unfinished. The record leaves us with this fact. The earliest civilizations documented not just creation, but the architecture of power, and those divisions echo into our own time.